Well, good evening, ladies. Can you believe this is our last study? Doesn't it feel like it just started? Where did the year go? But I hope and pray that you have been blessed and you have learned much through it. Uh, today we are in Lesson 19, Galatians 6, 11 through 18. Paul writes, See with what large letters I have written to you with my own hand. As many as desire to make a good showing in the flesh, these would compel you to be circumcised, only that they may not suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. For not even those who are circumcised keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. But God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. From now on, let no one trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you, with your spirit. Amen. Let's open in prayer. Oh, Heavenly Father, I am so thankful I am a new creation. And so I would ask that as we go through this scripture, as we dissect it, Lord, that you would just make your word come alive to each one of the ladies here listening, that they would feel your Holy Spirit just blessing them and pouring out your grace upon them. And so we give you this time. We ask that you speak to us through your word in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to read out of the New Living Translation as I study, or as we look at this study. And uh, verse 11, Paul says, Notice what large letters I use as I write these closing words in my own handwriting. Now, we kind of explored a little bit of this at the beginning of the study. Um, several months ago, and why would Paul need to do this? Well, there was a lot of speculation that Paul uh, had very, very bad eyesight. It doesn't tell us, and so we can only speculate. But we do know that he had to write in very large letters. So it could be that it was because of his eyesight that he had to write. You know, when your eyes are going bad, you do, you do have to write in bigger letters. It's like, you know, my eyesight is going bad, so I have 16 font. Pretty soon I'll be changing to 18 font. And for those of you that don't know typing, um, that's getting pretty big. And so um, I, I don't wear contacts or anything like that. So sometimes, you know, I have to have these bold letters. And so it could be something like that. Or Paul just wants to emphasize what he is trying to tell them. And so he's kind of using this last bit of the study to say, I want you to really get this. I have written this big or dictated this big long letter, you know, emphasizing every point, and now I'm going to give you kind of an outline here. And he starts off, point one, the Judaizers just want to look good. As he says in verse 12, those who are trying to force you to be circumcised want to look good to others. They don't want to be persecuted for teaching that the cross of Christ alone can save. So the Judaizers want to look good out of pride and also out of fear. Isn't that interesting? So right away we see that their motivation was all wrong. They didn't want to do it for Christ's glory they wanted to do it for their own glory. They wanted to look good so that they, uh, and they would do anything to achieve that. Um, I've been kind of following that story about Tom Brady. He was a, a patriot, New England patriot. And not this past year, because they lost the Super Bowl, but the year previous, he was caught, well, he, he still denies it, but he, he was caught with, with deflating the football. And what he had done is he did it just a little bit so it was easier for him to throw that football. And I remember watching that game. It was like he could not 
Uh, he, he couldn't miss a throw. I mean, everybody was catching him right and left. And of course, they blew away the other team and they won. And there was much cheering. And then all this came up. And of course, the other team felt like, you know, well, gosh, we've just been cheated. And so what had happened is they investigated and they found out that it appears, even though he still denies it, that he had gotten his uh, equipment manager to deflate the ball just slightly so that he could get used to throwing the slightly deflated football. But the other team, the other quarterback, had to, he was probably going, what is wrong with this ball? It doesn't feel right. And so it threw him off at the same time, giving Tom Brady an advantage. And so they've given him a suspension of four games. I thought that was, I mean, I thought he should have had more punishment, but that's just me because he truly did cheat, didn't he? And so what's the big deal, you know? Well, he cheated. That's what the big deal is. And so this is what the Judaizers were trying to do. They were trying to cheat so that they look good, just like Tom Brady was cheating, so he would look good. They're trying to cheat. In other words, they don't want to be persecuted for teaching that the cross of Christ alone can save. That's where they were cheating. And so they were telling the Galatian Christians, oh, you got to do this and you got to do that because you know what? We don't really want anybody to know that we're really followers of Christ because we don't want persecution from the Jews because we find out that, you know, they can be pretty vicious, can't they? And so it was a time when, when true followers of Christ were coming under great persecution. And so they were afraid if anybody found out, then they would have that persecution come upon them. So they were cheating, and they compromised the gospel to avoid that persecution. But we can't avoid it. 2 Timothy 3, 10 through 12 says, But you have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance, persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured. And out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. So that's the, the clue right there. If you're not suffering persecution, wonder if, you can't help but wonder if it's because the world doesn't know you're a Christian. I remember years ago, um, when I was in high school, in fact, there was this little uh, skit that my uh, youth pastor did, and we were all locked inside this room, and we thought it was kind of a game, but it was this really dark uh, Sunday school classroom. And what they did is they had some real policemen come busting through and say, what are you doing? Are you reading the Bible? And it was really an, an impactful uh, thing that they had done for us because then they said, okay, what proof do you have that you're a Christian? What proof do you have? You know, and the, the idea was that is if there was enough proof, is there enough proof that you are a Christian should somebody accuse you? And it was like, oh my goodness, is there proof in my life? Do I reflect enough that people would come down hard on me for my faith. And so that's important to remember. If we are following Christ, we will have persecution. But point two, the Judaizers don't want to keep the whole law. Uh, and, and they say in verse 13, and even those who advocate circumcision don't keep the whole law themselves. Isn't that interesting? They want to burden the Galatian Christians, but don't want to follow the whole law themselves. The do as I say, not as I do syndrome. Um, we do see this in cults today. Um, we see the, the, the leaders driving home in their Mercedes or Rolls Royces to their mansions while their followers live in poverty. We've seen that all over, don't we? They kind of sucked the congregation dry. Well, that's kind of what the Judaizers were doing here. They used the people to further their own selfish programs for their own glorification for themselves. Point three that Paul made, the Judaizers wanted to boast. 13b says, they only want you to be circumcised so they can boast about it and claim you as their disciples. 
Human pride is such a bane of mankind. I mean, I don't want to keep pounding on poor Tom Brady, but you know what? It was pride, wasn't it, that made him cheat. He wanted to look good. He wanted everybody to think that he looked good. I don't know how that could possibly make you feel good because in your heart you know you've cheated. Have you ever cheated at a board game? I have. Did it, Dave? <laughs> confession time. Um, did it make you feel good about your win? No, no. But they wanted to boast about their 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 congregation and how well they were, you know, getting more and more people to come to their fellowship. And it's always so easy to fall into. If we really think about it, we see this, you know, in all sorts of areas of our lives. We become very proud when we have somebody show up for our, our prayer meeting. You know, wow, they're coming because I'm here. You know, see how easy that trap is? You know, oh, they, they, they forget that this is, this is God's glory. It would be like praising a beautiful painting as if it created itself instead of the painter, isn't it? We are simply tools in God's tool shed. I like to think of myself as a shovel because, you know, that you can dig holes, and you know me in garden. I love, I love to dig holes and plant. And so I kind of think of myself as a shovel. I am simply a tool for the Lord. Isaiah 10, 15 says, But can the axe boast greater power than the person who uses it? Is the saw greater than the person who saws? Can a rod strike unless a hand moves it? Can a wooden cane walk by itself? Of course, it's a rhetorical question. No, none of these things can happen. We are simply tools in the master's hands. He can do absolutely wonderful things through us. But it's always the master that does the work. And so this is very easy for any leader to fall into. You become proud about how big your church is or your Bible study or how famous your worship team is. And you begin to think that it's all about you. I'm kind of reminded of that, that silly scene in, in Finding Nemo where uh, you have the seagulls and they're fighting over the spoon and they're all saying, mine, 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 mine. You know, and they're all saying the same thing. Aren't we like that sometimes? It's mine, mine. I want the glory. Point four Paul is making, we are to boast about what Christ has done. Verse 14, as for me, may I never boast about anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of that cross, my interest in this world has been crucified, and the world's interest in me has also died. Isn't that an interesting phrase? The world's interest in me has also died. They no longer care about Christians. They think we're the problem, don't we? It's never been about what we can do, but what Christ can do through us and for us. Paul understood this. Philippians 3, 4 through 8 says, If anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so, circumcised on the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuted the church, concerning the righteousness, which is the law, blameless. So he's saying, I have some pretty good credentials here. He gave a quick rundown of all the things that he accomplished in his flesh as a Jew. Anything that the Judaizers thought was important, he could outdo them. He, there weren't too many that had uh, such a bragamony, as I call them. And then he goes on in verse 7, But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. So all the things that the Jews thought were important, Paul has just laid waste. And the most important thing to Paul was that he now knew Christ. That's all that mattered to him. That's not so with the Judaizers. They had all these other things that were clouding it. He gave up everything. He counted them as garbage. All those things that he did in his flesh, he counted as garbage. 
and that's the opinion that we should have of our own selves. Anything that is not done for, for the glory of God is garbage, and we need to remember that. And it, it means nothing in God's kingdom. That's that wood, hay, and stubble that gets burned up. Point five that Paul was making, circumcision means nothing. Verse 15, it doesn't matter whether we have been circumcised or not. Okay, he is really rocking their world now. Circumcision was a big deal in the Jewish culture. I mean, they would throw parties and all sorts of things when their, their, uh, their son was being circumcised. And now it means nothing. Yes, that's what Paul is saying. In fact, none of the Jewish law means anything compared to what Christ has done. The Levitical law meant nothing. And so they are probably stomping all over the place, thinking this can't be happening. Those Judaizers were probably so angry at Paul for writing this. But... 15 says, what counts is whether we have been transformed into a new creation. That's what's important. Not all these works. The important thing is that we are now a new creation in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.17, it was in our worksheets today. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. We are a new creation. Isn't that such a breath of fresh air? It's like, wow, so all that stuff is gone? Yes, all that old stuff is completely gone. God has forgotten it as far as the east is from the west, from the east is from the west, and he remembers it no more. Do we drag it up in our own lives? Of course, and the enemy does too. But always think that God doesn't remember it. You don't have to keep confessing the same sin over and over. He's forgotten it. Don't let the enemy rip you off, saying that, oh, yeah, you were so bad back then. Don't let him do that, unless you want to use it as a testimony to the greatness of what God has done in making you that new creation. But we have that promise of new life. How can this be? Well, he grafted you into his vine. You are now one of God's children. You have the Holy Spirit grafted into, you have been grafted into the Holy Spirit, actually. But you have that DNA of the Holy Spirit, like I've said before. Um, I recently had the opportunity of going to a really cool nursery. Thanks, Marilyn. Um, And I was looking for an orange tree. And I looked at this orange tree. It was in a 15-gallon tub. And I'm thinking, wow, you know, it's it's a good size. I could plant this in my backyard. I want to put three fruit trees back there. And so I love all kinds of citrus. And I looked at this, and I'm going, oh, wow, $185? Are you kidding me? That is so expensive. And then I started looking at this tree. And it it didn't have any fruit on it, but it had all these tags hanging off of it. And I looked at this tag and it said navel orange. And I looked at this one and it said lemon. And I looked at this one, it said lime. And this one said mandarin orange. And this one said blood orange. And I'm going, oh my goodness, this tree has got all these different citrus fruits grafted into it. And I love that. It's kind of like, you know, that uh, the, the body of Christ is like that citrus tree. And we're all different, but we've all been grafted in. Isn't that a wonderful picture? That's what Jesus has done for us. We have been grafted in. We are now that new creation. All things are passed away, or all things have passed away. All things have become new. And so I started thinking about, uh, you know, other illustrations that we could use. And, you know, we all love butterflies. Most, okay, who doesn't like a butterfly? You know, I'm going to embarrass you. Okay, well, when Austin was a youngster, he absolutely loved all kinds of butterflies. And so I decided to um, give him a real treat one one year. He was only about five or six. And you could order caterpillars. And it came with this little tiny uh, terrarium. And so, you know, we we ordered it and they came, you know, overnight, you know, so that the caterpillars wouldn't die. And I guess you had to have certain things that you fed them. And so we cared for them. But almost right away, they began to form 
um, they, they looked like this, and after a while, you know, they began to form into their little cocoons. And Austin was devastated. He's going, Mom, the caterpillars are dead. And I'm going, oh, no, honey, they're supposed to do that. And he's going, uh-huh, right. My caterpillars are dead. Why don't you just fess up? You know, I'm going, no, honey, really, really, the caterpillars are fine. They're just changing. See, that's what happens with us. We used to be the caterpillar. That's our old life. And then we die to ourselves. And it's so that we can become a beautiful butterfly. That's how it works. And so we imagine Austin's delight when these emerged from those ugly dead caterpillars that he thought were dead. And he's going, oh, he was so excited because I didn't tell him what they would turn into. You know, I let that be the surprise and he was so excited. He didn't want to let them go. I had to talk him into it. I said, Austin, would you want to be cooped up in that little tiny box? No, he had compassion on the butterflies, and, and he allowed us to set them free. And, of course, we, we let him do it. You know, he opened it up, and he kind of put them on his finger, and, and he got them to fly away. And they were strong, and they were vibrant, and they were beautiful. What a wonderful example of what God does for us. We are a new creation. And then Paul says something really amazing. He says, may God's peace and mercy be upon all who live by this principle. What principle is that? That we are a new creation. That we have given up that old life. We have given up the law. And now our hope rests on Christ and what he did for us. And because we live by these principles, we have God's peace and we have God's mercy, that peace that surpasses all understanding. So, his sixth point was we are a new creation. Verse 16 says at the end, they are the new people of God. In the New King James Version, it says the Israel of God. Don't you find that interesting? So what happened to the Jews? Weren't they God's chosen people? Well, yes, they are. But we have now been grafted in. And don't worry about the Jewish people. Romans 11.23 says, And if the people of Israel turn from their unbelief, they will be grafted in again. For God has the power to graft them back into the tree. Isn't that wonderful? So we have now been grafted into the vine, just like the citrus tree, and we are part of God's family. Verse 17 says, From now on, don't let anyone trouble me with these things, for I bear on my body the scars that show I belong to Jesus. Paul, because of his service to Jesus, the true Messiah, he suffered much persecution. He kind of made light of it. But in Acts 16, 22, it says, a mob quickly formed against Paul and Silas, and the city officials ordered them stripped and beaten with wooden rods. They were severely beaten, and then they were thrown into prison. The jailer was ordered to make sure they didn't escape, so the jailer put them into the inner dungeon and clamped their feet in the stocks. Now, Paul and Silas were beaten with a bundle of rods, and I looked this up. What they would do is they would strip them, and then they would beat their backsides and legs until uh, they were bloodied. And the Jewish people only allowed 39 hits, but the Romans had no limit. Because they were known for their cruelty, sometimes they would beat them until they died. And so Paul put up with this type of punishment three times. Times. And so you can imagine the scars he had on his legs, his back, his sides. And then he was clamped in stocks after his legs had been beaten. So you know he must have been very, very scarred. So you can see why he didn't have much sympathy for those Judaizers that were afraid of persecution. He was saying, are you kidding me? You know, you're afraid of somebody being mad at you when... I have gone through all of this for the sake of Christ. He says, I bear those marks. So don't come to me again. Don't complain. 
Then he says, Dear brothers and sisters, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. That's how he ends his letter. What a wonderful way to end the book. He wanted the grace of Jesus Christ to be in their spirit. That is so important that we have that grace. We have been given so much grace. And the reason why we were given so much grace is so that it spills over onto others and we are able to give grace to them. But what can we take away from this? First, the Judaizers wanted to look good. It was all about them. Then the Judaizers didn't want to obey the whole law. You know, they wanted to be able to pick and choose which Levitical laws they wanted to obey. You know, if they didn't like it, you know, if it wasn't much fun, then they would kind of ignore it. But if it kept them from persecution, then they would embrace it. You see the hypocrisy there? And then the Judaizers wanted to boast about how many people they were getting to believe this way of Christianity, if you can call it that. Then we are to boast about what Christ has done and nothing else. And of course, there's plenty to boast about there, isn't there? I mean, we have the fact that he died for our sins and rose again. I think that's quite a lot. And not to mention the new creation that we are now new in Christ. And then circumcision means nothing. In other words, the law means nothing in God's kingdom. Nothing. We have that new covenant now. And we are a new creation. All things are made new. So how can we abide in these truths? A while back, I, I spoke about how you find out if you've been told a counterfeit. You remember what that was? That at the Treasury Department, they would have dollar bills, and they would have these inspectors hold, smell, stare at the real thing so that when a counterfeit came across their desk, they knew instantly it was not a real dollar. Something was wrong. They couldn't really pinpoint what it was, but they just knew it was wrong. See, that's how we know if what we're being taught could possibly be against God's word. And the only way you can do that is by studying God's word. The risk is too great. We can't ignore that, even in our busy schedules. And so I have an illustration here. This represents our life. This is an average day, OK? What the walnuts represent is our prayer life. And you know, prayer time is not just putting out our request to God, but also listening, isn't it? We have to be quiet and listen for God's voice. And of course, reading the word, because word is life, and applying it to our lives. And of course, fellowship. Do not forsake the fellowship. And that's so important in our busy times in, in, during summer. Aren't we just crazy busy with vacations and all sorts of things going on? We can get really, really busy. And so the rice represents all the many things that we have going on in our lives. We have husbands and children, other family members, school, work, recreational time, movies, walking the dog, all those kind of things, don't we? We have so many things that pull at us. And by the end of the day, you're just exhausted. And then sometimes if you're like me, it's like, oh, and I never got into the word. OK, how can we prevent that? Well, see, this is our life here. And if we just fill it up with all those things, I'm going to make a nice mess for Nini or whomever is cleaning up. Actually, I'm doing much better than I did this morning. So as you can see, when we let all these other things take precedence, you see that? It's almost, your day's almost filled up. Okay, and then now you're trying to stuff in your, your devotional time and your prayer time and going to church time and, oh, I just cracked my walnut. <laughs> see what happens? Well, you got to start taking things out because you didn't leave enough, leave enough room, did you? Okay, well, what happens if you do your devotional life first? See what happens. Hmm. All right, get my prayer time and my devotional time and fellowship time, study time. 
And now I'm going to pour in all my extra stuff during the day. Is it all going to fit? Hmm, I wonder. Got to give it a little shake. I only spilled a little, I promise. Oh, got to get that little extra duty out there. Maybe this would be the, uh, the window washing. I don't like to wash windows, but you know you have to do it upon occasion. Oops, sorry, Nini. All right, there's my busy schedule. Look at that. It all, you now have a complete day. And these are fun. You can decorate them. You can put a little ribbon around them. And whenever you feel like my day is too busy to get into the Word and my schedule is too busy to go to church, my schedule is too busy to pray, well, you know what? You can't afford not to. You can't afford not to. And it's amazing. If you actually give your time to the Lord in the morning, He does something during the day. That it, I don't know what He does. It's like He supernaturally stretches every the day out for me it doesn't feel long and tedious but suddenly everything goes smooth you know how uh, suddenly the lines are shorter at the grocery store you know the traffic seems to be lighter all because i put things in order i put god first everything else just falls into place isn't that wonderful remember that we can afford not to spend time with the lord especially in these summers these summer times are just crazy busy. If yours is anything, I feel like, oh, wow, I'm going to get so much done during the summer. And it never happens because it's one thing after another, isn't it? You see, if we put everything else before God, it will be easier to be picked off by the legalists. It will be easier to be led astray into false doctrines. And those things lead us back into bondage. Remember our theme verse, Galatians 5.1? Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. Do not, be do not be tangled up. God wants us to be free and breathe that free air in his grace, for he is our breath and we can't live without him. I know I can't. And we need to keep our eyes focused on eternity then everything else just falls into place. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we ask that you keep us faithful to be in your word. It is so easy to just say, oh, my morning is just too busy. It's so easy. I think we all know what that's like to fall into. But I know that you miss one day, and then you mix, miss the next, and then the next thing you know, sometimes a year can go by before you haven't gotten into the Word. Father, I know I've done it. And so I would ask that you just impress upon each one of these ladies the importance of staying in your Word, Lord, to be uplifted every morning and to have that, that filling of your Holy Spirit encouraging telling them that they are that new creation. And I thank you for that. So keep us faithful, God. Remind us. And so as we break up into our groups, I would ask that they um, further look into this, Lord, that they just solidify it in, in their hearts and in their minds so that they are able to become refreshed, free from any bondage. And so we give you this time. I ask that you bless it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.